Good evening, everyone. So today I will be discussing severe asthma exacerbation based on the 2019 BTS guidelines and the 2021 JNA guidelines. I would also be uh, sharing what we uh, really do in our ICU. So coming to today's topic, that is severe asthma exacerbation, how to manage it clinically. So first of all, whenever you encounter a child in the ER with a wheeze, the three questions that we need to ask ourselves is, is it really asthma? And if it is asthma, how severe is the asthma? And whether there are risk factors for mortality? Because whenever you have a wheezing in a child, it may not be essentially always due to an RAD exacerbation. It may be a simple aspiration. It may be a foreign body. It may be a cardiac wheeze. That is why that question is important. And how severe is an exacerbation is also important because there are certain drugs that are reserved exclusively for life-threatening asthma and not for a mild or moderate exacerbation. So that is also important. And before we dispose a patient, it is important for us to know that whether they have any risk factors for mortality. There are several risk factors that Gina delineates. So if you have any of these, especially prior mechanical ventilation is definitely considered as a risk factor for asthma mortality. Similarly, hospital admission in the last 12 months or ER visit for asthma exacerbation in the last one year. And someone who's currently on an oral steroids or recently stopped oral steroids, not on ICS, overuse of beta-2 agonist, food allergy, poverty and psychosocial problems, non-compliance with ICS and comorbidities all contribute to risk factors for asthma mortality. Now, what is a life-threatening exacerbation, which is what we are going to discuss today. So what is a severe exacerbation? So what we need to know that in pediatrics, we would consider it as a severe exacerbation or a life-threatening exacerbation. If the saturation is less than 92%, the child has tachypnea more than the age appropriate one and also tachycardia. So here, just see one thing that is for a child zero to three years to come to quantify him as severe asthma exacerbation is if the heart rate is more than 180. So it's very important for us to remember that tachycardia is a feature of severity of asthma exacerbation. Along with that, definitely you have other features like an exhausted child, someone who's not able to speak or drink, someone with a silent chest, hypotension, arrhythmia, poor respiratory effort, all would mean that the child is having a severe exacerbation or a life-threatening exacerbation. So what would you choose if this patient develops these symptoms at home or at a primary health center from where we are expected to refer the child? So would you offer a nebulization at home or would you go for an MDI? Remember, whenever you have an acute exacerbation, mild exacerbation is okay, but moderate to severe exacerbations, it's always remember that MDI has less tachycardia, causes less hypoxia, so that is preferred because as you can see that MDA, 20% of the drug gets deposited in the terminal bronchioles or the lungs, whereas with a nebulizer, only 12% gets deposited. That is because MDA has much smaller particles, so the distribution is more uniform, so ventilation perfusion mismatch is less with an MDA. And that is all the reason why we say that it is better that you go for an uh, MDA with a spacer or without a spacer with a spacer and with or without a mask. But I would say that if we are talking about a severe asthma exacerbation or a life-threatening asthma exacerbation, irrespective of the age of the child, it is always better to have a mask because when you are having a severe exacerbation, it's very difficult to purse your lips around the um, spacer when you're delivering it. So it's better to have a mask irrespective of the age. And the dose recommended is two to six puffs at 20 minutes interval for a child less than five years and four to 10 puffs, 20 minutes interval for a child more than five years of age. We need to know that when we say that two to six puffs, you are not going to give all the six puffs together. Instead, you give one puff, allow the baby to take at least five tidal breaths and then repeat the second puff and then see how your baby is doing. The, the number of puffs which relieves the bronchospasm needs to be repeated every 20 minutes. So if it is a small child and is requiring more than six puffs in two hours or, or a bigger child requiring more than 10 puffs in 24 hours, it indicates that the child is having a severe exacerbation and it is mandatory the child comes for a 
hospital visit. So that also we, do, we need to jot it down or tell the patient every time we encounter a patient with asthma. Now, when the patient reaches your ER, and we have already listed the number of danger signs the child has, that is severe exacerbation. Remember, do not use a nebulizer. Instead, better to go for an oxygen-driven nebulization. That means you are directly connecting the oxygen chamber at six liters per minute to the um, uh, nebulizing chamber, which would give you the fumes and would ensure that the saturation is between 94 to 98%. So here also you observe there is an upper limit of saturation that is 98 percentage. Now they say that even in asthma, hyperoxia is bad. So that is why you want to keep the saturation between that. So now you have started your oxygen driven nebulization. In case this is not available, that does not mean you will not give nebulization. You would definitely give, but this is preferable. Why do we say this is preferable? Remember, oxygen is a vasodilator as far as lung is considered. But when you have asthma, you have areas of severe bronchospasm leading on to collapse. You have areas of hyperinflation. So what does your body do? The your body does is the areas where the lung is well ventilated, it will re receive more blood. Whereas the areas which are collapsed will not receive much blood. That is what happens normally. Now what happens when you give your nebulization? When you give your nebulization, for a patient with bronchospasm, unfortunately, beta agonist reduces hypoxic vasoconstriction. So what happens, even those alveoli, which are less ventilated, will also suddenly start getting more blood flow because it causes vasodilatation and abolishes the hypoxic vasoconstriction, leading on to paradoxical hypoxia and increase in ventilation perfusion mismatch. So that is the reason whenever we have a severe asthma exacerbation and when we are using a nebulizer, it is always better to use an oxygen driven nebulization. Another thing you'll have to remember that when you're using a nebulization, you are using a far higher dose. 2.5 milligram would mean 2,500 microgram. When you're using an MDI, each puff could be only 100 microgram. So that's why the ventilation perfusion mismatch is more with a nebulizer than with an MDA. And that is the reason why we want it to be oxygen driven nebulization. We all know the dose of salbutamol. If it is a child less than five years or less than 20 kg, give 0.5 ml or 2.5 milligram. If it is more than five years, use one ml or five milligrams. So 0.5 ml and one ml is for the salbutamol solution, the multi-dose vial that Comes, uh, comes in the market and not for exactly the rust fumes. Now, why is it that we have gone in for a blanket dose of 0.5 ml for less than uh, 20 kg? The reason is when you have a small baby, the, even when you are giving a slight variation in dose, when we were students, we were taught that salbutamol nebulization dose is 150 microgram per kg or 0.03 ml per kg. Then came this new, uh, um, change. That is because when you are a small baby, the tidal volume will be less. So when the tidal volume is less, the amount of um, nebulizing solution or the air um, salbutamol mixture going in will also be less. So over a wide range of weight, it is okay to have a blank blanket dose. And this, remember, it is for intermittent nebulization. So you started the patient, <coughs> sorry, so you started the patient on salbutamol nebulization and you find that the patient's improvement is not satisfactory. So now what do you do? <clears throat> At admission itself, if the wheeze was very severe and patient was showing features of severe exacerbation, you can add ipratropium to the nebulizing solution. That is 250 microgram for those less than 20 kg and 500 microgram for those more than 20 kg. You can give it at 20 minutes interval along with salbutamol for the first one hour. That is what the GINA recommends. The GINA recommends that Ipravent should be given only for the first one hour in the ER. Remember, Ipravent is found to be more effective in adults than in smaller children. But BTS guidelines, the 2090 guidelines do say that you can continue 20 minute interval of Ipravent nebulization for the next one hour also. That means initially for the two hours, followed by four to six hourly. 
and if after the initial dose itself the child is better there is no need to continue to four to six hour you can stop it but in case the patient is being refractory and not showing improvement then the bts says that you can continue ipratropium beyond the first hour in fact that is what we commonly follow in our pico now when you have a child with an rad exacerbation with a heart rate in 170 180 which one would you prefer going in for a salbutamol or going in for a levosalbutamol now we need to remember if you remember the initial slide when we defined a child with severe asthma itself we said that tachycardia is a marker so here when you are having a tachycardia you should know that it is the severity that is causing the tachycardia that should not be a reason for not giving a beta 2 agonist so any child with severe exacerbation irrespective of the heart rate beta 2 agonist must be given but which one do you prefer in fact there is very little evidence favoring one over the other there are a few studies which say levosalbutamol is better but when you look at the meta analysis then you realize that there is not much of difference between the two especially when you're using 1.25 mg of levosalbutamol compared to 2.5 mg of salbutamol in fact all the side effects as well as the efficacy profile remains the same there is was a study in pediatric cardiology patients and there also they found that the heart rate increases by approximately 6.5 beats whether you're using salbutamol or you're using levosalbutamol another imp uh, important thing we need to remember is levosalbutamol is not recommended for children less than 6 years of age because in this subgroup of patients the efficacy is not established and there is an increased number of asthma related adverse events when levolid is used in children less than 6 years and the recommended dose by the manufacturer is 0.3 to a maximum of 0.6 mg three times daily in the 6 to 11 year age group so that is the reason why the recent guidelines really don't tell you about which beta to agonist to use they just go ahead and say that use salbutamol now coming to the next so you have started your nebulization with salbutamol you have added ipravent to it and simultaneously don't forget about steroids remember the maximum effect may take 4 to 6 to hours but there are some non genium genomic effects which starts having showing effect even before this 4 or 6 hour period like membrane stabilizing effect up regulation of beta 2 receptors inhibition of migration and function of your snowfill it is found to increase the peak expiratory flow rate as well as decrease hospital stay and relaxes so steroids is one of the cornerstone in the management of acute asthma exacerbation so that raises the question which steroid at what dose so what this we have to remember again and again that oral steroids is as effective as intra venous or intra muscular steroids but sometimes when you have a child with vomiting or once when you have a child with life threatening asthma oral steroids may not cannot be relied upon and you may have to give a parenteral steroid if the patient is able to take oral is preferred that is 1 to 2 mg per kg per day for a child less than 2 k 2 years the maximum dose is 20 mg and for those between 3 to 5 years the maximum dose is 30 mg and those between 6 to 11 years the maximum dose is 40 mg adult they say 50 mg now if you are using hydrocortisone how much do you want to give in fact bts guideline says that you need to give 4 mg per kg with a maximum of 100 mg 6th hourly gina in fact recommends a smaller dose even for adults they are recommending only 50 mg 6th hourly that would come to around 200 mg per day what we follow is 4 mg per kg 6th hourly methyl prednisolone can definitely be used especially it is considered that it has got a much more lung penetration one of the reasons why they say you can give it at a dose of 1 mg per kg 6th hourly another option that you have is dexamethasone which is not routinely used but why is dexamethasone important for us to remember because it has got one of the uh, methyl prednisolone has relatively lesser sodium retention you can see and dexa when you see comparatively it has the highest anti inflammatory activity but unfortunately because it has a longer duration of action and it may so it is associated with more systemic side effects other systemic side effects like immunosuppression more so that is the reason why dexa is not routinely recommended but dexa does have a role in acute asthma uh, management in the sense that it has been found that a single dose of im dexamethasone is almost equal to 3 to 5 days of oral prednisolone 
So what does that mean? If you have a child who finds it very difficult to take medicine, and that is not uncommon as far as pediatric patients are considered. So if you have a patient who finds it difficult to take oral medicines, then at the time of discharge or otherwise, instead of prescribing an oral prednisolone, you can give a single dose of dexamethasone in a dose of 0.6 mg per kg with a maximum of 16 milligram. Remember, it can be given only for two days. Never give dexamethasone beyond two days as far as asthma is considered, mainly again because of the longer duration of action and more systemic side effects. And if the wheezing is continuing beyond two days, it is better you shift on to shorter acting steroids. So now we know the different steroids, the doses, as well as the role of dexamethasone as far as acute asthma is considered. Now your child, you've given all this, your child is still not showing improvement. What about inhaled corticosteroids? So here you need to know that if a patient is already on inhaled corticosteroid and has an exacerbation, continue the same. In fact, doubling the dose has not been found to decrease hospital admission or decrease the duration of severity, so continue. If your patient has not yet been on steroids, then start steroids and inhale steroids double the lower dose. So that is what is recommended by Gina. That is all acute exacerbation, whether mild, moderate, or severe should not be treated with Saba alone. It has to be combined with an inhaled corticosteroid, which may be continued for two to three weeks or longer as you deem uh, important. But if the patient is already on systemic steroids, then it does not decrease admission risk. So our patient is that, right? You have given nebulization, you have given parenteral steroids, either oral or parenteral. And now do you want to give inhaled corticosteroids? So there are some studies which say that addition of inhaled corticosteroid might reduce the length of stay and asthma score in emergency room. So here you have to remember that you are talking about uh, inhale corticosteroid as a treatment in case of acute asthma exacerbation. So here the dose is much higher. So that is almost like 0.5 milligram of budesonoid every 20 minutes interval along with uh, salbutamol in the first hour. There are studies which also says that it can be continued 0.5 milligram sixth hourly during the acute uh, phase in the hospital also, but no strong evidence. So that is what something that is important for us to understand that inhaled corticosteroids are not the cornerstone of management. Systemic corticosteroids are what we are supposed to be using. If your child is not showing improvement, you can think of adding on inhaled corticosteroids. If a patient has mild to moderate exacerbation, they are using inhaled corticosteroid alone instead of uh, systemic corticosteroid is found to uh, decrease uh, the hospital admission. We are not talking about that. We are talking about inhaled corticosteroid in a severe exacerbation. So we understood the root, the role and the limitations. So now coming to the next one, that is magnesium sulfate nebulization. So whom do they recommend? In fact, uh, Gina recommends that if your child is less than five years, is not showing improvement to the above mentioned therapies, you can try a max self nebulization for those above two years of age with severe exacerbation. That's important, not for mild and moderate, it's only for severe exacerbation. And that is only in the first hour. That is, you can give three nebulizations along with salbutamol at 20 minutes interval in the first hour. But um, efficacy of magnesium sulfate, in fact, is not re of nebulizations is really doubtful in children above five years that is not being recommended. So if you are planning to give nebulization with magnesium sulfate, how would you prepare the solution? There is something different. Here it is recommended isotonic magnesium sulfate because magnesium sulfate is hypertonic. This, uh, it comes at a, as a with much a higher dose, 500 milligram per ml. So here what you have to do, you have to take 0.3 ml or 150 milligram of magnesium sulfate, add 0.5 ml of salbutamol to it, and to dilute it, instead of using normal saline, use distilled water, only then it will become isotonic. So, you, uh, so now we know the indications for magnesium sulfate nebulization as well as the limitations. Now your child has still not showing improvement. Do you want to take chest x-ray? You should know that routinely chest x-rays are not recommended because asthma, known asthmatic, coming with an asthma exacerbation, you don't have to mobilize the child for x-ray, just continue with your nebulizations and steroids. But if you're suspecting a pneumonia, if the patient is having subcutaneous emphysema, suspecting a pneumothorax, if there is a rapid worsening or not responding to treatment, 
or if this is the first episode of wheeze or you have localized wheeze because foreign body is a possibility in that situation definitely a chest x ray is mandated now what about blood gas do you want to send here again it is not routinely recommended but if it is a life threatening wheeze it is better you send for a blood gas and remember if you are finding that the pco2 is normal every time in an asthma exacerbation when you send a blood gas it is respiratory alkalosis a normal pco2 means you are dealing with a near fatal asthma so high pco2 normal pco2 you have to repeat your blood gas within one hour to see that the child is improving and to consider if not whether you want to go for a intubation or not intubation is associated with higher morbidity and mortality so we always try to delay or avoid intubations as far as possible but when indicated it has definitely to be done definitely should be done so now if your child has reached till here is the time to think about second line treatments so what did we understand till now if your child is not responding to your nebulizations ipravir steroids and even maxil nebulization then comes the role of second line treatment and second line treatment you have three drugs that is magnesium sulfate terbutalin and aminophilin and here it has been found that of the three drugs definitely magnesium sulfate is better is found to be superior to the other two and so when you are using a uh, magnesium sulfate uh, sorry and so uh, and uh, you have to understand when as far as terbutalin and aminophilin is considered a systematic review of um, four pediatric trials comparing iv salbutamol and iv aminophilin demonstrated equivalence so there is nothing to choose between these two that which one would you take so among the three the first one that you would be giving now would be magnesium sulfate and magnesium sulfate doses 25 to 75 mg per kg can be repeated after 6 hours but usually gina and dts are both recommending a single dose of magnesium sulfate in a dose of 0.1 ml per kg that would come to 50 mg per kg in normal saline over 20 minutes remember the effect starts in 2 minutes it plateaus in 20 minutes and lasts for only around 2 hours but what do we practically do what we practically do is we do give magnesium sulfate whenever we are dealing with a severe asthma we have never come across any complications while the maxel first dose is being given like hypotension which is described and we normally repeat magnesium sulfate after 6 hours if the child's uh, wheezing is not showing any improvement but it is also mandatory that we send for the magnesium level after that and if the magnesium level remains less than 3 we can consider a magnesium infusion of 10 mg per kg per hour over 5 hours that means the same dose 0.1 ml per kg you are giving over 5 hours so here you have to remember that all the present guidelines the gina and bts are both recommending only single dose what i said here is what we follow in our icu and also with the important thing message that you have to learn is that repeat dose is always given after checking for the magnesium level that is after the second dose now when giving the second dose you don't after 6 hours you don't have to be really that scared remember children with malnutrition you're giving 0.2 ml per kg so here you're giving 0.1 ml per kg first followed repeating the second dose after 6 hours so normally in indian population you don't see a problem but remember if your child has a renal injury there is high chance that the magnesium toxicity may happen so that part also needs to be kept in mind so now coming to the next controversial drug that is parenteral beta 2 agonist terbutalin or iv salbutamol so injection terbutalin is used to be used in children with severe life threatening wheeze in whom nebulization is difficult or not possible gina recommends a bolus dose of 2 microgram per kg followed by 1 to 5 microgram per kg per hour whereas bts recommends iv salbutamol at 15 microgram per kg over 20 minutes followed by 1 to 5 microgram per kg per minute in fact we seem to be following a, a guideline somewhere in between these two because what we normally do is we take 10 microgram per kg of terbutalin over 10 minutes and at 20 minutes interval we still continue to give at least three doses if the patient is not showing improvement remember this three dose bolus dose of terbutalin is no more being recommended by bts or by the gina guidelines 
and we do not go up to the dose of 5 microgram per kg per minute instead we limit to 1 to 10 microgram per kg per hour so that would be a much lower dose so every time you're putting someone on a terbutaline infusion remember it has to be in at least in an hdu or pediatric icu continuous ecg monitoring should be there twice daily electrolytes has to be checked because very high chance you may go in for hypokalemia especially with the continuous nebulization that is going on and it is important to check for lactate to look for toxicity if the lactate is going up please do stop the butylin so again emphasizing it is not routinely recommended it is reserved for those in whom inhaled steroids cannot be inhaled uh, beta 2 agonist cannot be used reliably and is not responding to beta 2 agonist monitor serum lactate it's beneficious only in children with severe asthma exacerbation and importantly if you have started an iv terbutaline please taper and stop terbutaline before you taper nebulization that is very very important you should not be having a patient on hourly nebulization with still running terbutaline because terbutaline efficacy is doubtful terbutaline side effect is more so your threshold to stop should be also very early and as already said what the dose that we use and where it should be given so now what about nebulization so we are talking about um, parenteral terbutaline so remember even before that you would have gone in for a continuous nebulization so when it comes to continuous nebulization it has a dose that is 0.5 mg per kg per hour in a child it is better you limit to 10 mg per hour in adults the total cumulative beta agonist that we can give in an hour is around 20 mg but it's better to limit to 10 mg so how do you pre prepare a continuous nebulization solution so what do you do you take a 5 mg per kg of salbutamol add it to 100 ml of normal saline so take a 100 ml normal saline bottle add 5 mg per kg of salbutamol to it and then um, place a use a infusion pump and then connect it to the patient's nebulizing chamber nebulizing chamber and set it at a rate of 10 ml per hour so this would mean that this nebulizing uh, solution is going to last for the next 10 hours which would give you a dose of 0.5 mg per kg per hour the main advantage of continuous nebulization practically is that you are not disturbing the child so every time you go near the bb you try to put the salbutamol nebulization inside the nebulizing chamber the child becomes irritable the child cries the child is apprehensive but once you set up like this the baby is comfortable nobody is disturbing for the next 10 hours the baby is getting the salbutamol nebulization continuously so bigger children smaller children any age group with severe b life threatening b is not responding to intermittent nebulization continuous nebulization is definitely an option another thing i would say is that when you are using the infusion the iv set here please remove the uh, rubber catheter at the end it is a practical tip because if you keep the rubber catheter at the tip a staff coming might think oh, who has put the iv inside the nebulizing chamber maybe i have to give it through iv itself so to avoid that confusion just do that also to for the patient safety so that is how you can give a, in fact you should know that in other places you have continuous nebulization chambers which would usually suffice for the nebulization for 8 hours but we don't have that freely available in india so this is what we commonly do so now coming to the most controversial drug that is aminophilin aminophilin you know it is an anti inflammatory it also has effect on the diaphragm but unfortunately its safety and efficacy has not been proven so it is not recommended definitely for mild and moderate attack not recommended for gina for severe asthma attack also they have categorically said in the 2021 that is aminophilin is not recommended because of the very narrow therapeutic index and doubtful efficacy but bts says that can be considered in severe life threatening attack non responsive to routine treatment practically telling when we have patients with lava and they come with a life threatening asthma we have often found that they respond to aminophilin better than uh, salbutamol or terbutalin infusion so it's a practical point so if um, if needed on a life threatening asthma in case uh, bts says that if all the previous medicines you have exhausted then you can think of using an aminophilin if you're giving an aminophilin how do you give it is 5 mg per kg in d5 over 20 minutes 
but do not give the bolus dose if the child has is on any form of theophyllin any oral theophyllin derophyllin the child has received please do not give the bolus dose so that's very very important in adults because they are often on theophyllin and so it should not be given and after the bolus dose it is followed by an infusion the dose ranging from 0.5 to 1 mg per kg per hour we traditionally keep it around 0.7 mg per kg per hour what is recommended if you are starting an aminophilin you are expected to monitor the blood level daily it is something that luxury that most of us will not have in india so what we practically do is whenever we start aminophilin we just give it for 12 hours after 12 hours we stop it i would say you can give can give even up to 24 hours because anyway what is recommended is once daily blood levels but if the patient is already on theophyllin it is better not to use aminophilin that's very very important and it is a theophyllin not using patient coming with a life threatening asthma if you are using aminophilin i would say preferable to use it for 12 hours so that you don't run the risk of having a toxicity and in case a patient is on aminophilin is showing increased irritability or vomiting please stop infusion because that is a marker of toxicity so now coming to niv so see we have come a little down on niv there are two rcts which has shown improvement in asthma symptoms and score but unfortunately these rcts have a higher risk of bias so definitely we cannot say that the niv is going to benefit an asthma patient but usually we need to know that nivs do improve oxygenation decrease work of breathing splints the lower airway and better aerosol delivery probably because of the lamellar flow so niv is definitely an option whenever you find children who are not responding to conventional therapy but niv should be offered only in an hdu or a pediatric icu now what about other experimental drugs ketamine now recent studies have proven that there is no benefit for ketamine compared to placebo in terms of respiratory rate oxygen saturation hospital admission or need for mechanical ventilation we have used ketamine once in a while but you know, clinically practically speaking we also have not found a great response to ketamine then what about ventilation ventilation as you see it is much further down in the list so after we have tried on everything we are thinking about ventilation and ventilation indications are always clinical you would be surprised that most of the textbooks mention the first indication as cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest that is because asthma ventilation itself is associated with increased mortality so that is why uh, everyone is re reluctant to ventilate but it is important to select patients at the right time that you intervene before they really going for these rs like situations so if you have an altered mental status especially coupling with a lab evidence that a severe hypoxia or hyperkaliemia causing a ph to fall below 7.2 or a child who looks very exhausted or severe work of breathing in whom the pco2 is rising by 5 mm every hour this would be patients you would try to uh, intubate electively and that too after you have tried all the asthma medications remember the moment a child comes with a severe asthma exacerbation we are not going to put the tube inside we are always trying medical management and when we fail the medical management only we are thinking of ventilation so today's discussion i would not be really touching upon ventilation in asthma that itself is a different topic or a longer topic we'll cover some time later so what about other mechanisms in adults especially sebo fluorine especially picus being manned by anesthetists they are comfortable with these gases and they use even in children there have been studies which are showing that life threatening asthma a sebo fluorine may be useful so if you have a facility for that and the patient is already on the ventilator you can consider that but then you should have the facility for these toxic gases to be not harming the other patients and remember and also ecmo where available ecmo may be considered in adults with near fatal asthma or refractory to conventional ventilator treatment so that was for acute asthma exacerbation for today thank you